part of the problem is that people who are tasked with governing are so distracted. You know, the thing about this electricity crisis for me, which we mustn't forget has been raging for, you know, what is it, 18 years? Yeah, 16 to 18 yeah, years now. There are major rewards out there if you support the ANC. The outcome at NASREC is not as picture perfect as it appears. Does this also affect buffalo farms? Or is it I, just... I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I, I thought all the buffaloes are going yeah. to Sudan. <laughs> Spread the Fire, welcome back to SMWX, and today we're once again joined by analyst, broadcaster, and thinker, Lukona Mguni. Lukona, thanks so much for joining us again on SMWX. Thank you for inviting me again. I hope I did not cause much trouble the last time. You caused too much trouble, and that's why you're back. That's why you're back. You know, it's, it's difficult to even know where to start. I mean, how deep is this crisis that we're facing at the moment, um, you know, in South Africa? I, I think we, we do need to appreciate the heaviness of the moment on South Africans right now and the heaviness of the moment from people who come with different backgrounds, from different walks of life, and are uh, really just... Let's start off. Is that the president? Let me, let me put this on side. I thought I had put it. Sorry, guys. No, nah, it's all good. It's all good, bro. I thought I'd put this on silence. I mean, all kinds of politicians must be calling you. I just simply deactivated my, um, my data, and then now people are calling. <laughs> Which politician was it? Tell I us. wonder. It's from Devin. <laughs> <laughs> Even more interesting. Yeah. No, don't worry. We're not too formal around so here. So it's about the heaviness of the moment. And when I say heaviness, it's multiple things happening at the same time mm. on the same bodies. So we talk about the power blackouts and the incon it's not just about the inconvenience of it. And I know a lot of people have focused on the inconvenience. Mm. I can't work at this time. But that inconvenience then translates into a harm on your livelihood because if you can't work at a particular time there's going to be a problem down the line where you don't meet your targets you don't meet expectations mm -hmm. and you are unable to fulfill the tasks that are before you we've heard a number of uh, you know small businesses closing down in actual fact the Soweten newspaper today uh, is leading with a front page where the black is the background because that's exactly what we're experiencing a cloud of darkness mm -hmm. because of no electricity and then a tabulation of as many small businesses across different parts of the country that are actually going down under because of this load shedding i mean as far back before stage six um, when i was on the radio someone called in and said i am losing my chicks it was then broiler chicken broiler farming mm. i'm losing my chicks because of load shedding i can't keep up the you know the machine at a particular temperature and then it's easy for privileged people to say then why don't you buy a generator mm. uh, or some people will just say the way to go is solar and i'm like it's not the way to go. First of all, we shouldn't be where we are, yeah. but now we are being normalized and conditioned into providing our own alternatives to, to state failure. But these alternatives are actually quite expensive. Huge. Not everybody can afford them. Then while you are listening to that and uh, navigating these power blackouts and trying to find alternatives, you get an increase in the cost of the electricity. Now, as a prepaid buyer of electricity, what it means is that it's like buying airtime and yet you can't make phone calls. Mm. It's that basic. <laughs> Imagine. The airtime gets more and more but expensive. The airtime gets more and more expensive, but you can't make phone calls, <laughs> and it's going. Yeah. Now, that's what it means. You buy electricity, but you're not guaranteed the service. But mm. the service provider has your money. That is a harm, Right. These harms are not only materialistic, they are psychological. I think the, the biggest cost of uh, these power blackouts soon is going to be, you know, uh, an affection of, an, an, an affecting mental health. Mm. It's going to be uh, people feeling 
paralyzed and not knowing how to get out of the ditch these power blackouts are putting in yeah. with them. That's more mental strain and stress. And it's then, of course, unfortunately, stress in some people um, it graduates to physical health problems, mm-hmm. strokes. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, hosp- hospitals, ho- hospitals themselves are, are facing blackouts. Then, then you build, you, you can build the externalities to these problems. Mm-hmm. And then you've got mm-hmm. another problem. You're navigating all of this and... Maybe you still can't transport your goods properly because the condition of the road is bad. Um, and when you listen to leaders who are meant to do something about this, it's either they play the blame game or they make light of the situation or, like ESCOM did on social media the other day, starts telling you how to drive around during load shedding. What nonsense is that? Yeah, look... There's so much there, and I want to dive deeper into that because, you know, the thing about this electricity crisis for me, which we mustn't forget has been raging for, you know, what is it, 18 years? Yeah, 16 to 18 years now. Yeah, nearly two decades, is also the communication of it. I mean, it's bad enough not having power, but being treated like your intelligence is being insulted while you don't have power is a is a different thing and the way this crisis is being communicated the way you have to drop everything and one day you get told stage six indefinitely yep. then it's stage two then it's sta- and and the the psychological burden of the way we're being shoved around by this communication just baffles my mind so so on the one hand you've got a governance crisis but you've also got a communications crisis which in my view shows contempt towards people well the communication crisis is a symptom of a governance crisis mm. where there's a disregard for the people you are communicating to absolutely if at a governance level there wasn't contempt for citizens mm. there would be greater transparency of the processes that are harming and hurting us. There wouldn't be concealment of documents and information to the public. Mm. There wouldn't be a need for engineers at ESCOM, some of them, to be made to sign non-disclosure agreements. Mm. It's bizarre the things that are happening behind the scenes that show general contempt and disregard Mm. for the consumers. Because at the end of the day, the, the power is generated for citizens who consume this electricity. Uh, Yes, you may argue that they pay in differentiated ways depending which municipality you are at and so on. That doesn't matter. But this service is being provided for consumers. The way in which you govern determines how you communicate. The communication has really at times just by lies. And you can just tell when the press briefings are happening that we are now swimming in a skew of lies (laughs) and we are accepted to you know, nibble on this cue and uh, believe it and, 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 and accommodate and go with the flow of these lies that are being told to the public. Sometimes there are breakdowns that are not even told to the public and yet some engineers would already know hmm. that these breakdowns two to three weeks down the line are going to visit us with load shedding. Hmm. At times there are moments when engineers are calling for load shedding and the powers that be would say no. And you see this contempt when uh, there's not going to be load shedding because it's state of the nation address, mm. because mm. Uh, it's the king's burial, uh, of, uh, the king of Amazulu's burial, because it's this particular event of some national importance. Yeah. What you do at that moment is you flog your infrastructure that you keep on claiming it's ailing mm. to its maximum and you ban tons of diesel in terms of liters. Mm. Uh, uh, you, 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 you do so much harm to your infrastructure just so that you serve a political outcome, not an engineering outcome. Um, when you have load shedding today and you say tomorrow because it's the state of the nation address, but my fleet is still not uh, to, to, to the right you know, degree, it means you are serving a political outcome through a bad engineering solution and you are further causing more harm. The other thing that is a time overly stated 
mm. is to defer responsibility to unseen third forces. So there's sabotage. You know, once you use the word sabotage, you're talking about clandestine activity. You're talking about activity that nobody can be held accountable for in the immediate, but you excuse yourself as the person most, um, you know, responsible for the delivery of this service because in actual fact we are working against unseen forces that are sabotaging you. And yet the truth of it is that the sabotage started internally. External forces will only penetrate poor environments, poorly led, poorly insulated, poorly cushioned, and poorly governed. External forces are unable to penetrate solid environments. It's that easy. It then means that in the personnel that you even have within ESCOM, you've got rogue criminal elements masquerading as engineers, artisans, employees, personnel, managers. You've got high degrees of poor leadership in terms of important things. I mean, the biggest thing about ESCOM is maintenance. The ease at which you are able to get the parts that you need for the infrastructure that needs to be maintained, the procurement processes around that, uh, the transparency around the contracts in terms of who's doing the maintenance and who's not. Do you still have internal teams at ESCOM that do maintenance or you don't? Has it been all outsourced? Uh, these are the kind of questions that we cannot provide responses to because the information is not there. The information does not sit with us. I think one of the ways that maybe we have failed in media um, is reporting and talking and discussing this question from the perspective of the palace at the union buildings, which is crumbling, no doubt, or even Megawatt Park and what the rate is doing and, and what ministers Gordon and Mandashe may or may not be thinking at any given time. And not focusing on the human suffering that's being caused by this. I mean, this is historic human suffering. You know, this is, I mean, there are, there are war zones which can provide more electricity than South Africa is providing right now. Uh, there are humanitarian crises which haven't, you know, gone to this extent of just people in homes, in rural areas and townships, nurses, teachers, doctors, uh, unemployed people who are trying to make a living who now also have to contend with this uh, power blackout crisis and also just the demoralization of the country. And maybe we're not talking about people enough um, and just how much suffering this is, this is causing. No, certainly, and sometimes I think it's the desperation to find answers and get to the right place. So you possibly focus your energies on the people who are at the heart of causing this crisis. But like you are saying, what is the human cost um, of, of this crisis? I mean, the human cost is huge uh, because at a high level, this crisis means you are unable to attract investment you, because you cannot guarantee electricity uh, for companies to operate. At a human cost level, you suddenly now, I mean, people in the agriculture sector are saying, we, we can't milk as much volumes as we used to milk because our storage capacity has diminished. If this crisis pertains over time, something is going to give. Mm -hmm. It's either the cows, and if the cows give, the people who look after the cows will do the milking, and suddenly somebody who worked in that farm as a breadwinner in their household has no income, and suddenly in that household there's no income. So, Does this also affect buffalo farms? Does I, I wonder. <laughs> 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 I, I thought all the buffaloes are going yeah. to Sudan. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. The, 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 the human cost, in actual fact, in my mind, is yet to come. Mm. The, 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 the short-term human cost we are seeing is the tip of the iceberg in terms of long-term effects of where we are going to be. Because there are companies that are forced to close and probably will never look back yeah. and reopen. 
And that means those households already feeling the compounding effect of, you know, intergenerational unemployment, not just, you know, high unemployment. Because sometimes we say there's high unemployment. There are households, Siswe, where there hasn't been a person working since 1994, formally employed. They're on survival mode. They, they, they literally from day to day are grinding to see where they'll get something to eat. Sometimes they do odd jobs. Sometimes they do uh, unpaid labor for survival and so on. So <clears throat> this issue for me is definitely a humanitarian crisis, but that points to some of the problems people have been pointing out to over the years. Absolutely. So over the years, people said... There's a problem of corruption at ESCOM. It's being used as a cash cow uh, to benefit uh, politicians, connected people, rogue professionals, and, and, and. And you see it in the ballooned costs of building Kusile and Medubi. And I mean, this is brand new infrastructure, but often you hear a chimney in Kusile, a unit in Medubi, this and that, unit so and so has blown up and affected unit five, all, all of these things. These are new power station. So sometimes the issue at ESCOM is not told truthfully. You can't make a blanket statement and say ESCOM has an ailing infrastructure. Is the new infrastructure working at uh, its optimal levels? At least 95% optimum levels? No. At any given time in Kusile and Medupi, something is out which affects the ability to generate to the installed capacity of these two power stations. So the actual issue here is we have not taken seriously red flags when they are raised as a country. Mm. Now, ESCOM is but one indicator of what could go wrong. There is possibility of much more going wrong in this country, like some municipalities having to close because they just don't have cash. Mm. And what would that mean for residents staying in those municipalities? What happens when ESCOM goes around attaching assets that municipalities need to deliver services to people, but ESCOM needs to attach those assets because those municipalities owe ESCOM, right? The, we are at the brink of a real state of emergency, which might take decades for us to come back to. The first, first root cause that people should be committed to now is to say the corruption that we've done and mismanagement is exceedingly harmful. At least let's have a truce on that. You know, if we were to negotiate one thing is for those who are corrupt and for those who are deliberately mismanaging our assets as a state is to just say, please, just one year, don't steal. Don't mismanage. Do your job. Because therein you refocus people's minds to the task at hand. Because part of the problem is that people who are tasked with governing are so distracted. Because while they are trying to govern, they are also trying to see where, where, where do I take uh, and how do I stash without being found out. And because they are at the, at the heart of the kitty, they, they just see the cash. But they forget about the reality of how indebted we are, how indebted ESCOM is, and the cost to society and humanity of that. And I am suggesting that we need to probably go to communities and tell the stories and hear from communities of people who live with individuals in their households um, who need oxygen, and these uh, machines operate with electricity. We, we, and, and this is not to make people feel bad, but this is simply to highlight the death effect of all that has been gone wrong, all that we have warned about, and that when it finally comes together, this is what it means for people for individuals um, when you are at the risk of a food shortage mm. because of power blackouts, you begin to realize the, 
multiplier effect yeah. Yeah. these actions have had. You might have stolen 10 years ago and made your money and you, you know you are comfortable. You probably even have the option to go overseas and live overseas because of that money you stole. Mm. But what has been the effect on the people? Because that's why when people are corrupt and they steal public funds, it's always made, the point is always made. You are stealing from the people. Now, with all those problems, if the prices go up, if the difficulty for storage is there, your supply is impacted. And when your supply is impacted, it can only mean that on the demand side, the prices are definitely going to go up. Because if suddenly there are five bottles of milk available and 20 of us want them, mm. um, I'm going to make a quick buck as the person selling the milk. I mean, it's like COVID, right? Uh, those who are buying things in the black market, they, they understand uh, what this means, right? The markup price that you put in there. But also the cost, the, 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 the manufacturer is always going to shift the cost to the consumer. And suddenly you've got more problems where even the grants that the state offers as social security to different categories of people are no longer enough. And then the question becomes, should you increase the grants? And then the government says, but we don't have the fiscal space to increase the grants. Do we go and borrow the money for us to develop that fiscal space? Or do we let people remain the way they are? And, of course, governments will always try and temper with the spirit of a revolution where people revolt against a government, and therefore maybe they will borrow, as you've seen, we've borrowed at times just to consume, not to invest. During COVID, we did this. You compound the problem because that debt belongs to future generations and limits the choices that they will have about their own development and their own sustainability. And what you then are cooking effectively is a social crisis. It's true. And it's, it's worrying. I mean, one almost wonders how there isn't more pressure. I mean, it's, it's a matter of time and these things can happen in the click of a finger, but the ANC government has has really been lucky in these last few days, even weeks, that you know people haven't haven't become even more uh, incensed with the way their lives have been have been just torn apart in many ways. And I guess this does connect us to the governing party, the party that has been governing South Africa for nearly three decades now, uh, the African National Congress. And I'm interested because you have a very unique perspective on the ANC. I have to commend you for calling a number of things right. <laughs> I remember months and months and months ago you said Nomvula Mokonyan is going to be the DSG. Yeah. It was close, but... Quite close, yeah. But you had that right. When many people were saying, no, Zuelim Kize looks like he's got momentum here, you were saying, no, I think still 60-40. You were right. So... I take your political analysis very seriously, um, but you also were on the ground. Some of us were just like, uh, uh, Nazrek and easy. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't deal like yeah. with, with Nazrek. You were there at the January 8th statement. So before we get on to questions of the, the politics of the ANC, just, just help us understand behind the scenes what the ANC conference uh, was like and what the January 8th statement was like and take us into the ANC at the moment and what those events were like behind the cameras because the ANC is always good even though it fails at presenting itself as a stable organization but what was it like to be at Nazareth? what were you hearing what were the things you couldn't necessarily say on on camera <laughs> Well, That's behind I, the scenes. And I suppose you are, you are hopeful that uh, the passage of time uh, means the, these things can no, be said on no camera. Cameras here. <laughs> there are no cameras here, leader. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's it's fascinating to be at conference because you you get to be inside plenary and 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 see the delegates you know gauge the mood uh, the sing offs that happen you know uh, between uh, different factions and rival groups um 
but also you get to talk to some delegates from different parts of of of, of the country um, in informal conversations and of course sometimes formal on air but <clears throat> there are a number of things that stood out one Nasrek confirmed that the ANC is in an administratively chaotic space. People will, will disagree with me, but I, I will continue to make the point. No self-respecting organization would start conference while some of its delegates are still registering. And not just two, in their hundreds. Because what you do, you deprive those delegates of an opportunity to listen to the political report, to listen to the organizational report. The only reason Nasrek started the way it did was to save the ANC from embarrassing headlines that says, that would have said, the ANC fails to start conference for two days. I mean, there were ambassadors who had been sitting at Nazareth from 9 a.m. when they were expecting conference to start on the 16th of of, of December, right up until, um, because I remember I had a flight to catch in the evening, so I left while the president was still speaking. I was like, no, no, I'm not going to wait for it. I don't want to miss my flight for it. Um, You started about half past four, five, uh, with the political report. And then a moment happens. Again, I'm inside the hall. And as President Ramaphosa is about, he starts talking, there's commotion. <clears throat> then we all look, oh, former President Jacob Zuma uh, is walking in. I mean, it must have been a staged walk in to coincide with that. And then it, I mean, some delegates from KwaZulu Natal go into a rupture of song and dance on top of tables asking, when's Enozuma, when's Enozuma? I mean, I'm still dumbfounded that they haven't found an answer for themselves that what, what did former President Zuma do? I mean, of course, I'm going to take a lot of flack uh, from uh, hardcore loyalists of former President Zuma no, for this comment. I think it's comment. very important to but, not, not to do this thing where people create, well, there's one side of the NC that did nothing and there's another yeah. side. We have to criticize the entire party. Uh, absolutely. And we know the, the devastation that happened during the Zuma presidency. Yeah. And we know the devastation happening now, too. So w- w- people can't surely be asking these questions unless they are proxy questions for other political fights, which happens a lot as well in political circles. But for me, that moment of a former president walking in that way to disrupt a president of the ANC... What was it like seeing that up close? um, And I was probably less than 10 meters away from where President Ramaphosa was. Mm. And then there was a bit of a standoff. Um, Gwena Mandashe then called... Um, security to come forward uh, that sort of uh, riled up the chairperson of KwaZulu Natal. Then there was a huddle between the chairperson of KwaZulu Natal, Peggy Kele, the minister of police, and Gwena Mantashe, uh, the chairperson of the ANC, and they were having a bit of a you know a tense conversation. You could see the moment is tense. One of the of the things you, that you could feel in the air was the tension that is there, but it's a tension that's fueled by something. <laughs> ANC comrades no longer respect each other. You can disagree with somebody, but if you still respect a person, there's a manner in which you disagree with that person. If you still respect a person, there's a manner in which you engage and not degrade the dignity of that person. If you still respect a person, there's a manner in which you engage not to the detriment of the organization and you still preserve something about the organization, not in a false manner, but in a real genuine manner, even if you disagree with the person. One of the things that has really eroded in the ANC is respect. People just don't respect each other anymore. That's, that's Nasrek. But the last thing about Nasrek yeah. is that members of the ANC are quite dejected mm. from the ANC. That's interesting because you don't see that on the camera. No, no, no. They won't give it to you on the camera. Yeah. Members of the ANC tell you, in two delegates who come from my hometown, we're like, Ish. we are worried. Say, but why? 
say we are not doing well. But in Canada, they won't say we are not doing well. Of course, you've got some senior figures in the ANC who will try and speak this truth about the ANC is in trouble. I mean, you heard uh, probably in the January 8 uh, message of support, Zingi Swalosi said that the ANC has to get its act together or else we will not be able to convince workers to, conv- to, to vote for the ANC. That's where the ANC is. And she was really speaking the truth about it. Um, so... I mean, I spoke to a deputy director general in one of the senior departments uh, in government at Nazarek, and he fled, said to me, if as DGs and DDGs we don't shape up, the country is going to be in trouble because there's a problem upstairs. And by upstairs, he was referring to cabinet. This is an ANC person, very senior ANC guy. Sure. Very traveled ANC guy. So my biggest problem right now with the ANC is that many of them know they are not on the right course. But at the same time, they are unwilling to correct. And this is where we have to put some pressure. And I also want to get your views on the outcome of Nazrek, which I don't think has been sufficiently analyzed. But... This is where we don't put pressure on everyone in the ANC. And I mean everyone. You know, we we are prepared to criticize Ramaphosa. We are prepared to criticize Zuma. But I'm afraid the crisis is so deep that this now belongs to anyone and everyone who is prepared to defend this or who is prepared to sell us hope three decades down the line. It's the young people who are playing both sides. They want to, behind closed doors, say, yeah, this thing is broken, but then come out and defend it. It's the former presidents, all of them, uh, who, again, want to play both sides. They want to criticize, but then still be close. And there's this thing where people are hedging their bets. You know, they, they have one foot in the ANC and one foot outside. And that is the that is more damaging than the corrupt elements in many ways. In, in fact, that is that is far the greater crisis the ANC faces, where the only reason people remain public supporters, um, well, not all of them, but there's a high number of people who remain public supporters of the ANC, people who who, who continue to join the ANC, people who. Um, want to be seen as attending and supporting events of the ANC, they solely do it as a manner of buying social and economic currency. Because proximity to the ANC, by virtue of whether you like it or not, remains the governing party, therefore a power holder, that association remains profitable for a lot of people. Listen, I've seen that up close, by the way. Like, it is very easy. Yeah. I always laugh at people who, who say to me, like, EFF and, and all of this. And I'm like, do you have any idea how close I am socially to the ANC? Yeah. And do you know how easy it would be to trade on that and the economic? No, of course. And there are major rewards out there if you support the ANC. Yeah. If you just say the right things, you, you can be a millionaire. Absolutely. I mean, uh, some people will even ask me... Uh, Uncle, why are you sleeping on the job? I say, what job? I say, but uncle, you are close to these people. We could be getting opportunities. I say, what opportunities? No, but uncle, just stop speaking so badly of them. And hey, Lukona, you could be a spokesperson. You could, you could be a deputy minister. You... Oh, oh, a, 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 an advisor to, to the minister or something, you know? And, and stop all this criticism. And your life and your family. Pay, pay 20 rands. <laughs> And we need to talk about that, right? Because there are people who look at, the, make the calculation. And to be fair, not everyone is in the same economic position and, and it, the economy outside the ANC is difficult. But we have to start, I'm afraid, putting some shame on the people who are getting out of the shame because they criticize one day and they're in the party no, the no, next no. It's, it's people who are literally double-playing, as you were saying. And, and it's a very dangerous thing because it could stunt the, the, the progress of the country. Because sometimes these people uh, carry weight and are credible. Um, they are seen as moral voices and therefore uh, they are courageous enough to criticize 
while they're still inside. And, you know, people, it, 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 it's, it's a mind play as well. Because then people say, oh, at least you, you can actually see the problem, but you are still inside. Okay, but we, we understand. So there, there are still people like that who enjoy massive credibility in society, even though they are still inside the ANC because of this idea of a courageous uh, voice that is able to speak voice of reason to a point that some of them even present themselves as the rejected voices of reason by the party. And of course they wouldn't go because the ANC is all that they've known. They've belonged to it for about 50 years, for 40 years, for 35 years and so on. But it's a it's a problematic view in a democracy because in a democracy, our commitment should be to the championing of this constitution that we have agreed on. And of course, amend it where it needs to be amended, but the rule of law, order, and all of these things. And I mean, I've said in some interviews uh, as radical views to say, the IEC should have rules to deregister a political party that it can be proven is overwhelmingly flooding the public representative space with people who are causing corruption because that party is not adhering to the dictates and demands of the constitution and the oath of office its members take. You can't say there's corruption and then you, you cannot pinpoint the corruption can't self manufacture. People drive corruption. People get into positions by way of political parties. Now, some people will say, do you know that administrators are more corrupt than politicians? And I say, yes, in some instances that is true. But if the politicians were not collaborating and colluding with the administrators, probably they would have gotten rid of the corrupt administrators surely by now. So there is a tango here. And of course, some of the administrators belong to political parties. But I want to focus on political parties because these issues are very serious. We don't have a standard um, of deregistration of political parties that is connected to their conduct while in office. You can't keep uh, allowing a political party uh, that is ruining society um, to be a registered player. Surely you can say, yeah, yeah, but the people are there to reject it. Hey, but guys, uh, the people uh, in all democracies sometimes... Uh, follow what is there. The question becomes, what if that is the only choice you present to people? So there are a number of things that we have to think about. I mean, I'm not saying this is a solution, but I'm saying this is a conversation we should start having because corruption is not self-manufacturing. I mean, you've got instances where the president stands up and tells you about corruption in a municipality in the free state in, Mad in, Mad in Madibeng or Madibeng or some, some, uh, I'm just forgetting the proper name of the municipality. And then tells you about the gangsterism that has, you know, found itself inside that municipality. But at the heart of that gangsterism are some members of, you know, whether, you know, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in, in council. Those members of council are voted in. So if you can't deal with your own members in council, what hope does society have? What remedy does society have from irresponsible deployment to the state? We've got to ask these questions, and there have to be penalties for parties that, uh, just as much as I do think that, there has to be penalties for parties that don't exercise internal democracy. You can't have parties that don't exercise internal democracy promising to be champions of democracy in society. It does, it does not match, because a party has to give the the, the electorate some indicators, and those indicators are best done by its internal operations. And those internal operations, chief amongst them, has to be a sense of internal democracy. Because if you are allergic to internal democracy within your organization, how then are you going to suddenly be a champion and a progressive, you know, advocate of greater democracy in society, as some of us have been calling, whether it's electoral reform uh, that is needed, whether it's transparency, whether it's re thinking procurement and, you know, minimizing the space of corruption with tenders and all of these things. How are you going to champion those things when in your own political party you do not resemble that kind of behavior? So the, the, the point really is to say, for me, what makes the ANC extremely dangerous for society is that the people inside it know the problems that afflict the ANC and have simply no capability 
to solve those problems. So effectively, they say to South Africans, here is a compromised vehicle. It has the problems of uh, we manipulate uh, membership, we buy votes, uh, we are factionalized, we are disunited, we are not renewed, we are actually the old, we are not modern, we don't speak. If you listen to Tabang Makwetla, for example, during the policy conference in July, uh, we don't speak to all classes in our society. Yes, we aspire towards non-sexism and non-racialism, but these don't reflect in the makeup of our leadership and top structures. In actual fact, we don't deserve to lead you, but... We give you the promise of renewal. Therefore, give us a chance. And then you give them a chance. And then five years later, they say, now we are ready to renew. Just, uh, preparation. Now, 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 hang on. Now, hang on. <laughs> South Africans have to think hard and deep. Uh, somebody said, when a car breaks down on the highway, you got to move it to a workshop and fix it. You can't fix it on the highway. Mm. Let alone while it's speeding down the highway. Ragged as it is. Mm. Gokeli, what's your um, analysis of the outcome of NASRIC? So on the one hand, I think the dominant view was Ramaphosa basically swept the board, uh, barring the Mashadile question, this was a resounding victory. Uh, in the days leading up to the outcome, we had a lot of talk that, goodness, it looks like there's almost a groundswell and a shift away. So that's one view. But, and there's no doubt that Ramaphosa and the vast majority of his slate is in, in power in the ANC. But then you take a step back and you, and you think about second-term bids within the ANC. I mean, Mbeki didn't even, I think he was uncontested. Zuma won uh, three quarters of the vote at Mangawung. Um, and Ramaphosa comes in with 500 votes. So a swing of two, 250 or 280, something like that. And many of the people in the slate get in, you know, by the, by the skin of their teeth. So on the one hand, you have a president whose slate succeeded. But on the other hand, you also have the weakest successful second term bid. And so how do you analyze where the ANC is now and the outcomes of the NASRAQ conference number two? I'm going to tell a story of what happened um, at the January 8th statement uh, in Bloemfontein. As the president was speaking, delivering the January 8th statement, some ANC officials started alerting the media that they will get an opportunity to doorstop the deputy president. So some of us say, but if you are announcing it, it's not a doorstop. It's a media briefing. You must say you're calling a media briefing. So this media briefing was meant to take place next to the stage. And unfortunately, at the time, Makadzi was performing, and it was just a rao, rao, rao. So then a decision is taken that, no, let's find an alternative spot for this interaction with the deputy president and the media. Now, as this is happening, but some media people are asking, this is unprecedented that after the president has spoken, giving the NEC January 8th statement, that a deputy president would then come to the media. It started sounding offish, sending alarm bells that all might not be well already post Nasdaq. So we walk around the running track um, of the stadium um, and through to form the deputy president has his own solo, uh, you know, stadium uh, wave and greet. Uh, he, had part, he had been part of it when the president and all of them as top seven officials came in into the stadium. 
And this is a long walk around the stadium. Under a tunnel, a spot is found, and this media interaction begins. As it happens, th- th- there's just something that doesn't make sense about why the desperation for this media briefing, why the urgency of this media briefing, where is the president anyway to unpack the January 8th statement to the media? No president will do it tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Then as that briefing was happening, Kweda Mandasha walks past and he says to one of the ANC people he was with, Chonga, Chonga, now yeah, I'm closer. Uh, I understood the tonality and the mannerism with which he was doing to say, look now what is happening. Then he approaches uh, Keith Koza, and I think they have a, a back and forth in terms of, well, not a back and forth, but Gwede just expressing himself as to why is this press briefing happening and so on, and he leaves. And other people filed through, and they, you, you could just watch. So I now stopped listening to uh, the briefing, and I turned around, and I started looking at people as they reacted to this, uh, your monthly Kungubele walking past and looking, what's going on here? Um, I even spoke to one of the younger leaders um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ANC to say, I'm not sure why this press briefing is taking place. Why? And he said, that's why I'm not even anywhere close to it, and I'm running away from it, because I, I just don't understand what comrades are doing. So I'm telling this story to demonstrate that the outcome at Nasrek is not as picture perfect as it appears. One of the risks the ANC took was to be drawn into the private matter of the president, Pala Pala, and take ownership of it and make it an ANC matter. Because when the NEC said they will not process the Integrity Commission report, which had to do with Pala Pala, digital vibes, and many other things, this should go to conference. And once conference said no, these reports, we just want a high-level summary as part of the organizational report, The reports are to be processed by the NEC. Now the question is, is this new NEC perceived to be, you know, overwhelmingly supportive of President Ramaphosa, going to be able to process the Integrity Commission reports, particularly the Palapala report and the view of the elders and the Integrity Commission of the ANC on how the president has handled Palapala and what the political cost of Palapala has been or could be to the ANC. Are they going to process that report? Because if they are not going to process that report, it is going to mean that they are kicking for touch, and it will also mean that President Ramaphosa has become just another ordinary politician who survives by the virtue of majority rather than by the strength of his integrity. This is very important because... My reading of the outcome at Nasrek is that the numbers are not the big issue. The question is whether or not this president is going to survive to 2024. And what a player like Paul Mashatile is going to opt to do with the scandals around the president, whether to amplify them for his own gain to rise as the deputy, as deputy president to president, or is he going to put the interests of the ANC first because research shows that President Ramaphosa is far more popular than the African National Congress and, of course, far more popular than Paul Mashatile himself. And that a campaign led by Paul Mashatile for the ANC in 2024 would be a much weaker campaign than a campaign led by President Cyril Ramaphosa, depending how far this Palapala issue goes, because we're still waiting for some other reports that have nothing to do with the ANC. ANC universe, thank God enough, uh, the public protector, the South African Reserve Bank, they've got to give us some reports into the questions that they had asked the president and what they've received. In actual fact, I would have thought that the South African Reserve Bank one is much more straightforward than any. So I'm not sure why we are still waiting six months later uh, than when they had asked for their last response and so on. So the point is this. Those who don't support the president will still hang on to this possibility of his scandals catching up with him. 
the president, if indeed he is now strengthened and he realizes the threat of Paul Mashatile, he's not obliged to appoint him as deputy president. He holds that key. Is he willing to go to some political war by virtue of just retaining his current deputy president in the state and going to 2024 and so that he limits the opportunities for a Paul Mashadile to maneuver around him, but also for a Paul Mashadile to gain public stature. Because once he becomes deputy president in the state, then he would have to be, you know, sent to certain tasks, have much more of a media profile, and all of these. And so, in fact, this win, while it may be with a greater majority, for me presents a number of headaches for President Ramaphosa. And the first big headache that he's dealing with now, if you thought load shedding is it, it's cabinet reshuffle. Let's get on to that. And and the Mashatile question is an interesting one immediately. I, I need to check my constitution, but I saw an article, um, I think it was by Mzili Gazi or Africa, who was talking about the reshuffle, and it had an interesting fact in there, which I also need to check, which is that the deputy president has to be an MP. No, it's a constitutional fact. Nobody, you can't be appointed deputy president if you are not a member of parliament. And the other thing we need to check is at which earliest time can the ANC change uh, its lists uh, to parliament? Because you can't do it on any other day. The IEC opens a window of opportunity yeah. uh, in stages for that to be done. So on, on the question then of Masha Dile, we will get a clear indication because there will have to be this process before. It's not a simple question of reshuffling and, and putting him in. And then Ramaphosa would have an excuse to say, well, I want to do it quickly, but this is going to take long. So for now, and you know, Ramaphosa's for now can last 10 years Absolutely. and his very quickly will never happen, oh, no. you know, so. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mysterious. <laughs> exactly. So that would be the first indication. Is there is there a move to install Mashadila as, as a MP? member of parliament? Yes. Exactly. Um, and then there are other questions on the cabinet, which is NDZ, Kosazana Tlamini Zuma, there's Lindy Wesisulu, those who opposed the president. So let's start there, and I, and I have further thoughts on the on the potential reshuffle. Of course, the president could then say, I'm tied in terms of making you deputy president. Um, I will appoint you a minister because uh, the constitution permits that um, a maximum of two ministers uh, can be non-MPs, uh, right? So... He could navigate it that way. I mean, Paul has been a minister before, minister of arts and culture, and um, say that is that is that that is the problem. Two vacancies now are there by virtue of Figil and Balula becoming a secretary general, and it's a full time position. George Law. George Law left for the World Bank and so on, and was never filled, and there was someone acting. So two, uh, Prof. Leng Wemkize, Deputy Minister uh, as well, uh, at never replaced. So you've got those three clear-cut posts. The, 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 the greatest headache yeah. is going to be, is he pressured by those who support him to withdraw from cabinet? some people who have clearly been defiant towards his cause. Uh, Minister Lindwe Sisulu, Minister Nguasa Zuma, of course, are the most too obvious. Uh, but uh, knowing President Ramaphosa and being politically correct, is he going to remove women from his cabinet? But also, I would say on this score, if my reading of things is that if presented with a choice, Dr. Ngosa Zanajlamini Zuma has a far greater chance of surviving than Lindwe Sisul. I just get a sense of cemented relationships between the two, uh, NDZ and, and, and CR, even though they may have batted heads so many times. The other question is going to be, 
how is he going to justify continued tenure in cabinet of those who support him but are extremely pathetic in what they do? So do you keep Estelle Andabeni in cabinet? What, did she, what has she achieved, both at communications and now with small businesses? Um, Godan. Do you keep Pravin Godan, who has appallingly led our state-owned entities and even tried to sell them off for nothing, hoping that he would not be held accountable? Somebody who is extremely allergic to being held to account. He hates it. He squirms at it and he wishes he could probably throttle people when they hold them when they hold him accountable. The cost of his leadership at the Department of Public Enterprise is the result of where we are with South African Airways, with ESCOM. I know he'll say state capture and this. I mean, come on, demonstrate. What have you done in the last three to four years? And you were there. In and the of state course, you were there anyway. when state capture happened. Uh, you were there when you took a poorly, a poorly calculated decision. If you read Jahana's resignation letter as CEO of SAA. Jahana argues that the, 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 the understanding was quite clear. SAA would be under treasury until such time the turnaround of SAA was to a healthy status and it would be brought to, back to the Department of Public Enterprise. What did Pravin Godan do when he left treasury? He left with SAA to DPE, only to go and sell it for whatever we don't know, actually. We don't, even that 51 rise, I'm not sure if, if people have seen the deposit sleep of it. But what, what is quite clear... And I've, 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 I've done my part there trying to get accountability. That's for sure. Um, and in sometimes it was lonely. Of course, it's a lonely task, but now you see the voices are getting many. And so on. But that SAA deal, for me, the fact that we have not drilled into the scandalous nature of that deal. And then to go to Parliament and say, well, actually, I'm going to conceal this from the South African yes. people for commercial reasons. I mean, which, which are none. I mean, the public interest is overwhelming. You then get rid of a director general. And then there are, of course, uh, things that um, are floating to say, no, in actual fact, it's the DG who was also trying to push back. I mean, we, we, we sort of saw the... Uh, blow up that led to Sam Kokeli leaving that department and then nobody ever followed up as to Sam why did you really leave what was this chief of staff thing and so on I think I must bring him here maybe maybe and maybe I think he'll have good stuff to tell you about that department but um, the cabinet, cabinet cabinet because we I mean we could probably go on all day about each of these so, ministries so, of course so we can we can do that with each of the ministries but I'm trying to say there are ministries that cannot survive, even if the focus can't just be on those that have opposed Ramaphosa. The focus must also be on those who support Ramaphosa and their departments are appallingly performing. The other headache Cyril has to solve for is of his supporters like David Makura, Pakstau, Nongeba um, Mshauli, um, because now they are now political actors. Where do they go? And while we hope that, I mean, for me, it's a timing issue. The best time for him to reshuffle cabinet, if he has an appetite to do it, is to do it before the State of the Nation address. So I anticipate cabinet before the State of the Nation address. If we get to the 9th of February and the president has not reshuffled cabinet, I can tell you now, that cabinet itself will probably come after July. Hmm. You know, there's another, another difficult question, which is the reverse of the question, what does he do with the people who have supported him in cabinet who haven't done a good job? Which is, what does he do with the people in the NEC who don't support him but are popular in the party? So when you look at the NEC list, when you look at the election outcomes, yeah. it's fascinating because Ramaphosa swept the board... But the most popular people in the NEC don't necessarily support him. So we've got a fascinating situation. Gigama, Lungisa, I mean, an unprecedented campaign to even be in the NEC, let alone at those numbers. I mean, conference spent hours discussing just Andile Lungisa. But the, 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 the discussion around Andile Lungisa was not about Andile Lungisa alone. It was 
also a proxy battle by young people to say that we are here and we are going to begin to assert ourselves. And that's why there is a bit of a jubilation among some young people because they feel that the people who have graduated through the youth league like Malusi Gigaba, Sitle Zikalala, Mtumiseni Nduli, Figile Mbalula, Pule Mabe, Mzwandile Masina, are now quite a compelling force and that's not a pro, in the National Executive that's Committee. That's not necessarily a pro-Ramaphosa no. force either. Even if some of them may be pro-Ramaphosa, the question is whether or not they may not put uh, more value yeah. on their generational fight than a fight for Ramaphosa. The, the Kikaba question is an interesting one, right? Because here's someone who was basically one of, if not the, the most popular person voted onto the NEC at various times. There's a headache in terms of the State Capture Commission and various allegations swirling around him. But you can see the president's... The pre, I mean... What's probably most likely is that he doesn't necessarily appoint him, but let's see. But if he doesn't, then uh, how does Gikaba take that? If he does appoint him, he's going to have a, a headache on the other side. So there's some very, very so, so, tricky so, 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 A second term. I know people, people like to romanticize things. A second term is one of the weakest terms of any president because members know that post this term, life does not reside with you. We've got to solve our allegiances with the next guy. And given the record of the ANC is that you're not even going to finish your second term as state president. So the question really is those who wish to plan succession after Cyril Ramaphosa, when do they start? And does that starting further divide the ANC than already is divided. Because unfortunately, even those who support the current president will want to be part of the future, post this president, and therefore will begin to shift. So actually, the analysis of the composition of the National Executive Committee is done at a purist, uh, uh, with a purist lens of what the uh, physical outcome looks like, rather than uh, factoring in the future. And all these people that we are mentioning, fairly young, fairly peers. So M. Dumisen Induli, who has not become SG today, will he stand? Would Asitle Zikalala oppose him? Uh, will Figil Mbalula want to graduate to another senior position of deputy president, president? These questions, unfortunately, have already begun. And if they've begun, they have a great possibility of distracting the organization, but also they've got a great possibility of beginning to create an uncomfortable support base for the president. That is one foot supporting the president because he's there now, but the other foot is trying to solve for the future, which is away from the president. Yeah. We haven't even, I mean, you mentioned it, we haven't even spoken about Pala Pala. Yeah. Um, the Concord still has to come back to us on this question of the review that the president launched. Well, the question is, how soon is, is how, how serious is the president now going to take the review, given that his party voted down the very same report? Absolutely. And so we, we sit in a situation where this is going to roll on because opposition parties aren't going to let it go. The ANC is not going to admit anything. The president's not going to admit anything. So it's not going anywhere. And, you know, I think we've had a period where a lot of focus was on the ANC. But suddenly we're going to zoom out of that as the year unfolds. And opposition parties, maybe one day civil society, won't let it go. So that thing is going to continue to embarrass and wrong foot the president. Uh, as that's well. why this is where I said the, the biggest risk for me that the ANC did in December was to adopt a private matter of the president and make it the business of the ANC. Because as the Palapala issue continues and morphs into different forms of life, it will no longer just be about President Ramaphosa. It will be about President Ramaphosa and the choices that the ANC made, and society will remember that. Mm, mm. Um, finally, uh, Lukona, you, you're a master of, of the political prediction. <laughs> So I have two questions for you, because um, a lot of people watching this show 
are also interested themselves in being political analysts, the next generation of analysts, up-and-coming analysts. What is your method and process for analyzing South African politics? How do you do it? Um, because you're one of the best at it. And people often look at uh, people on TV and look, there are analysts and there are analysts um, and think it's an easy thing, you know. Um, but take us into how you analyze South African politics. And then if you have any predictions for us or if you have any views that uh, we'll be able to verify at the end, which you always seem to get right, like Nomvula Mokonyane or... Um, you know, many of the things you've predicted before, that the new dawn won't be a real dawn. Uh, leave us with one of those. <laughs> no, thanks for the flattery. I don't think it will get you much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have any tenders to... No, no, I've got nothing you know. to... Do you have an, an analyst tender or something? Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, one or two. <laughs> I mean, look... Um, the more you do your work, uh, the more some people, you know, gain confidence in you. They call you to come give uh, them your views, high-level briefings and all of that. So, I mean, um, I I remember that, um, at least for me, this is not something... I mean, you call a political analyst by accident of label uh, from the media. That's the first. True. Uh, the media finds you doing your work in your small corner. Uh, I was just uh, probably, say, 2007, 2008. Uh, beginning to just write some things on my Facebook. Um, then I wrote an open letter that blew up uh, to former President Jacob Zuma in February 2010. Um, and that sort of attracted a lot of uh, media attention. And as we went by, I mean, I would start sounding out certain things. One of the things, in actual fact, <laughs> talking about predicting, um, in 2011, I really highlighted the problem of political killings and what it would lead to. did an interview with Cat Blanche and so you grow. Uh, you grow, one, in your confidence. You grow, secondly, in your stature, I would say, uh, being given opportunities. But uh, one, I mean, I, I, mean, I think my, my first my, my first port of call is to the gatekeepers that decide who becomes and who doesn't become a political analyst, that those gates must open up much more. There's a greater talent pool in society. There are far wider voices, and we need to hear as many of them as possible. And for all my, my part uh, in the media platforms where I've had the opportunity to curate conversations, I've, I've given as many voices as possible. I mean, I've contributed in the, uh, in the I wouldn't say mentoring, but trying to open up space uh, for certain people, legal analysts, economic analysts, and, uh, and political analysts. Um, my method is very clear, and it's, it's also my method to broadcasting. It's my method to uh, waking up in the morning and playing my part as a law-abiding citizen is that you must have a vision for your country. What's your vision for the country? Not, not what the Constitution says and so on. What's your vision for the country? Once you have this vision for the country, you are then able to say what set of values and principles would guide those who are building towards this vision and how do I hold them to account to these sets of values. So for example, I believe in an extremely accountable government and so I don't understand why we must have rules that say the president can only go to parliament once every quarter to answer questions. Uh, the president is not obliged to have media briefings. Th to me, all of these things don't make sense. To me, an ideal president is one that would every fortnight do a question and answer session with the media. Why? Even though the media is not elected, it is probably the closest sound and unfiltered sound to the people of South Africa. To Parliament, why not monthly? Just go and update so that, so it also then, you know, morphs into questions of uh, transparency, being responsive, and appreciating ideas. For example, the State of the Nation Address, I would do it in reverse. Um, I really think that I would be animated to see a president who says, this is day one, 
I do have what I want to deliver as a state of the nation address, but I'm rolling my sleeves today. I want to listen. What is the state of our country? And opposition parties, citizens are allowed to, you know, stream in and share their views and so on, so that you present a state of the nation address. This thing that we listen to called the state of the nation address is not the state of the nation address. It's something else because it does not give you the true essence of the state. And then you measure how has the state of the nation shifted in its material well-being, in its uh, moral well-being, in its uh, heartbeat between the last one to this one. So my analysis is, I mean, of course, there are standard things. You must read widely, know what's happening in the world, follow the news and so on. But spend more time thinking. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Think about certain questions even if you are not asked about them. What's your view on political public morality? Uh, what's your view on the way in which we should elect representatives? What's your view on how those who are in public office should behave? How should we do procurement? You, you don't have to be asked these questions, but you've got to grapple with them so that when you are there and you are analyzing, you are being asked the questions, some of the responses come naturally because you've spent time even interrogating your own position on them. And of course, don't be afraid to revise your position. That's the last one. But honestly speaking, you've got to be deliberate. And one of the things I find extremely frustrating in South Africa is that uh, broadcasters just go to work to do their work. Uh, they're not deliberate about the kind of society they want to live in, the kind of uh, country they believe they deserve and their fellow citizens deserves. And for as long as, for me, there are a lot of people floating around um, as, as broadcasters, as analysts, who simply just want to appear on TV, sound on the airwaves, or be read on the newspapers, but they've not defined for themselves the type of society they want to live in, I don't feel that they are hitting uh, the mark where it should be. Absolutely. Any, any predictions you've been thinking about or any things that you think people should be thinking about for the future? I'm going to write about this uh, this week. Uh, we need a book from you, by the way. I, I'm not going to make a public commitment, but you know where that project is. I'm just sits. saying, comment down below if you think we need a, 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 book, a book from the corner. <laughs> I want to caution South Africans about 2023. Hmm. It's going to be a very noisy year. They are going to be civil society organizations organizing in apolitical ways for change. There's going to be new political projects coming up. There's going to be uh, presidents, uh, definitely one of the former presidents' uh, foundation is going to come out as well, trying to organize concerned citizens and sections of society. Uh, there's going to, of course, be our work as well at the Ravonia Circle, uh, you know, mobilizing people's power to act, as we call it, and so on. I just want South Africans to be careful as they interact with all of these attempts towards change and make sure that these attempts are about the real change that South Africa needs, which is political change. Anything that is organizing and falls short of mobilizing people to unearth their political power towards the polls of 2024 is going to generate us the status quo. And I'm quite clear in my mind that 2023 is going to be the year where South Africa lost it or where South Africa resisted it. Hmm. Well, Lukona, thank you for all you do. I don't think we give people their flowers enough in our political discourse where we often tear down before we build up. But I think you've been a token for accountability and a champion voice for holding those who have been above criticism to account. And all the best. Thank you for the work you do. And thanks for joining us on SMWX. Always a pleasure. I've got time for you any day, my brother. And I love reading the comments uh, on the chat. So I'll be <laughs> camping. I'll be camping there. I always say the comments down below SMWX videos are better than the opinion pages <laughs> of, of many of many newspapers. No, no, no. Again, it talks to what I was saying. 
give as many voices a chance as possible because people then become quite sterile um, in how they express themselves because they've been writing that column for five years every Sunday. I mean, I mean I'm not taking a dig at anybody, but you, you get it sometimes that the juice is gone. You probably need new blood for some, some juice to flow. Kokeli, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Aye, 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 aye.